this book for the next few weeks, and uh, there's a lot in here. And uh, so we want to uh, hear what God has to say to us through the, uh, the Apostle James. But we want to begin with prayer and ask the Lord to minister to us here tonight in the study and also to those who are watching us. Uh, please get your Bible if you haven't already done that and uh, turn to the book of James and be ready to, to uh, get into it with us. But we want to pray, ask the Lord to touch the sick. We have several that are sick tonight. Uh, we want to remember my wife's mother, uh, Jean Orm, continue to pray for her. And uh, also for uh, my wife, Cindy, that uh, she will have strength uh, to be able to uh, take care of her mom for a few days. And uh, Sister uh, Effie Nipper, we want to continue to hold her up in prayer. In a few days, she will be 103 years old. And uh, so we are uh, looking forward to her being able to celebrate that birthday. And uh, so remember her as you pray. Uh, Sister Judy Smith's son, Troy, we want to continue to hold him up at, before the Lord. And there, there are many others that we, uh, we continually pray for. And if you have requests, if you're watching us tonight and you have requests, uh, you can put those in a notation to us. And uh, we will make sure that they, they are brought before our, our uh, church for prayer. And uh, we want you to feel like you're a part of this, even though you may not be able to be here in person. So uh, feel free to do that. And uh, are there any others here with us tonight that you have a request you'd like to make mention? Just remember Sister Twala and her daughter Sonia. Sister Twala, uh, uh, Queener, uh, has come down, I think, with COVID. Is that right? So let's remember Sister Twala that uh, she'll get through this uh, without any uh, ill effects other than what is just normal with that. And uh, so keep her in your prayers tonight. Any others? Sister Pat, we want to continue to pray for Sister Pat Evans. Also, uh, any uh, people who were here today, um, I had a niece to pass away. Good. And uh, she's the fourth one I've had, the fourth, not niece, the fourth relative I've had to pass away within the last four months. Okay. Five months. All right. Okay, Ruth Norris, let's, Brother Dean's niece, Ruth Norris, let's remember that family in prayer. And that reminds me also, uh, some of you watching us tonight, and maybe some of you here might know uh, Brother Jerry Caldell, who was a pastor uh, in our church for many, many years. He passed away Sunday. Uh, and also Brother Harvey Jenkins, another retired pastor, passed away Sunday. And uh, so we want to hold these families up in prayer that God would touch them and strengthen them through this uh, period of uh, change in their lives. Uh, God will draw them close to him and, uh, and comfort them through their uh, time of sorrow. So join with us in prayer now. And uh, as we mentioned already, let's pray about the lesson tonight that God would open the word to us and give us something special. Father, we come into your presence right now. We thank you, God, because we know that your grace is sufficient to meet every need that we have. There's no sickness that's too great for you. There's no pain that's too uh, severe that you can't relieve it. There's no heartache, Lord, that's so, too deep that you can't re raise us out of it. And, Lord, we just ask you tonight to minister to these needs, uh, these that have passed on to their reward. They've left families to... Uh, to to grieve over them and to uh, have memories of them. And Lord, we just ask you to draw them to you and let them, Lord, feel your presence and your arms around them and, and the love that you can give to them that only you can give. So minister to them tonight, Lord. And we pray that you would be with us as we look into your word tonight. I pray, God, for your grace and your mercy. I ask that you continue to uh, bring my, my mother-in-law around with her uh, injured shoulder. We pray, God, that they'll... There will be no need for the surgery that they, they talk like uh, that they may have to do. You could take care of it without that, Lord. And we just ask you to give her rest in her body and peace in her spirit tonight. And we just ask you once again, Lord, to open your word to us now as we look at the book of James. We want to receive something special from what he has written to the church. So to God be the glory for all that is accomplished. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right.
as we begin with this study, I want to give you just uh, kind of an overview of what uh, the book of James involves and some things about the book itself before we actually get into dissecting the uh, individual uh, verses. The epistle of James, uh, when if you've read through it already, uh, what you may not even realize that you have read and seen in his writing is it's a picture of what the life of faith uh, should look like. He talks a lot about the life that we are to live. And we come to realize by, by reading the book of James that we demonstrate our faith by the way we live our lives. People can tell if you're a person of faith simply by the way that, they, that you live your life. There are 108 verses in the book of James. Within those 108 verses, there is almost 60 commands. And we'll be looking at those as we go through the study. But belief in the gospel is not just a thought conceived in the brain, but it's an action of the heart. And it's an action that alters the way we live our lives. Although it is not called the gospel of James, you can see the gospel in every chapter. When you read between the commands, those 60 commands, you see the grace of God being presented. There are some things that you don't see in the book. And I had never really realized this. The many times that I've read the book of James, I never realized this. Some of the things that you won't see there. James never mentions the cross. Now that, that kind of amazed me. <laughs> that in, in, six, or in five chapters, 108 verses, he never once mentions the cross. He doesn't mention the resurrection. And he only mentions the name of Jesus twice. And because of these omissions, there are some theologians and, and other scholars who have shunned this book. And some that even thought it shouldn't have been included in the canon of Scripture. In order to be accepted as worthy of inclusion in what it, we call the canon of Scripture, the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament went through a process called canonization. Canonization is the process which the books of the Bible were determined to be authoritative. Men did not canonize scripture. I want you to understand that. Man did not canonize scripture. Men simply recognized the authority of the books that we have in the scripture as being God inspired. There are many ancient texts other than what we have in our modern Bible that were examined for possible inclusion in the canonized uh, scripture. Uh, the books of Maccabees comes to mind. And there were others that were looked at, but they were not determined to be actually God-inspired writings. And so they weren't included. So what are the criteria for canonization? There are basically three that are used to identify books that have been inspired by God and thus they are worthy of being included in the canon. First, there is apostolic origin. Did one of the apostles write them? Then there is recognition of the, the text by the church. Was it viewed by the church in general as being inspired of God? And then the third was apostolic content, which is similar to the origin, but not necessarily 
written by an apostle, but it contained information that would be apostolic. And until the coming of Christ, the, the Hebrew text that makes up the Old Testament was already accepted by Israel as being God's word. So it was not necessary for that really to go through a process of canonization because Israel already accepted it. And the early church would go on to establish other criteria for canonization of other texts. There were church councils, and we'll be talking about a couple of those in a little bit, that would take up the question from time to time. But by the time these councils had taken place, the first being the Council of Hippo in A.D. 393, and then the Council of Carthage in A.D. 397, by the time these councils met, the church had already inherited the Hebrew Scriptures. The Old Testament was already being uh, read by the church. So by the time these councils got around to discussing the books that should be included in the New Testament, the Christian community had already accepted the four Gospels and most of the epistles as being God-inspired. Well, it appears that the New Testament we have today was already regarded as God's inspired scripture a hundred years before these councils took up the question. Man can be late sometimes in what he tries to do. There's much more that could be said about the process of canonization, uh, but we just aren't going to have the time to do that. I just wanted to give you that little bit of information. <clears throat> so now let's look at the authorship of this book. The author identifies himself in verse 1. Let's look at verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting so it's generally believed that this James was the brother of Jesus. Now James was a common name back then, just as it is today. Two of the original disciples were named James. That was James, the brother of John, and James, the son of Alphaeus. And then there was another James that came along who was the son of Zebedee. And so James was a very prominent name. But of these, the brother of Jesus was the most prominent in the early church. And he was most commonly believed to be the author of the book. Now James, the author of this book, was very instrumental in the work of the church at Jerusalem. He kind of headed up things. He might have been what we would call our general overseer. He kind of directed things, uh, the work of the church. And he was very instrumental in, in resolving the dispute over the Gentiles having to keep the law. We talked about that in our last study. And James had a lot to do with that. He's the one that gave the final answer that said we've... Uh, don't feel that there's any need for us to put on you more than these necessary things that seem good to the Holy Ghost and to us. And he lists those things that uh, they should do and nothing else would be required of them. So what do we glean from the book? What are we going to see as we study this book? Well, in the first chapter, we see God at work in the life of the believer. We see how he matures us. We come of age in the book of James. We see him, God, as a generous giver of wisdom. And we learn that every good gift comes from above. Now that's all in the first chapter. In the second chapter, we see God's love for the poor and that he is a friend to those who believe. In chapter 3, James tells us that true wisdom is a gift from God. And we'll be looking at that. Chapter 4 tells us that God gives grace to the humble. We could all use some more grace, couldn't we? And God gives that to those that will humble themselves. 
Chapter 4 tells us that God gives grace to the humble. Chapter 5, we see that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And then he answers prayer. James is a hard-hitting uh, hard letter, I guess you could say. He talks a lot about practicing the faith. It kind of resembles a series of sermons. I have, uh, in my time in pastoral work, I preach sometimes on a series of sermons along the same kind of subject. And that's a little bit of what James is, is like, a series of sermons. And once you get past the introduction... You find none of the traits of other epistles or other scriptures or uh, books of the Bible. Most of them began with the same kind of introduction that James did, identifying the author, asking for God's grace to be upon the readers and that sort of thing. But James wanted the readers to grasp an important truth that was taught by Jesus. And that truth is a tree is known by its fruit. And so as we live our lives, people should be able to see the fruit of the Spirit in the way we live. And so that's a very important truth that James wants to get across. So for James, the test of true re religion is doing the truth, not just hearing it. He condemns counterfeit religion that accepts theory in the place of practice. Again, let's look at James 1 and 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, the twelve tribes that are scattered abroad. So James describes himself as the servant of God. He doesn't call himself the brother of the Messiah, but the servant of God. He recognizes that though he had attained a high position as being pretty much the, the leader after the ascension of Christ, James basically is the leader of the church. Even though he has reached that position, he was not comfortable in that. He was more comfortable in the role of a servant. He realized that his place was not as a master, but as a minister. Scripture tells us that we are not to be lords over God's heritage. So that's the way James saw himself. And although he was the brother of Jesus, he felt it was his honor to serve Christ rather than boast of his relationship with him. And in this first verse also, James describes who he is writing to. The book of James is described as a general epistle. By that we mean that he's not writing to a particular local church, as Paul did in many of his writings. He's not writing to a particular individual, as Paul did in writing to Timothy. And others that he wrote to. It, he's writing to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. And so we want to look a little bit at that scattering. Some of this scattering was the result of the persecution and execution of Stephen. And anyone that has studied or, or read about that, you know that that was at the hands of Saul who later became Paul. He was standing in the crowd when Stephen was executed. And that's recorded in the 8th chapter of Acts. For those of you that might be uh, taking notes on that, you can read that at your leisure. But this persecution was at the hand of Saul, but many of the tribes of Israel were dispersed during the wars of the Old Testament. So he couldn't be talking about just New Testament scattering 
because that would have included basically Judea and Samaria. But he also intended for all those who had been scattered throughout the years. Ezekiel, the 11th chapter. And I know you probably don't have time to turn to that, but I'm going to read it to you. Therefore say, and this is the Lord talking to Ezekiel. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and, have all, uh, and although I have scattered them among the countries, Yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. So that kind of indicates to us that the scattering that James is talking about is not just a result of New Testament persecution, but also of Old Testament wars and conquerings by other nations. It was the heart of the apostle that those who were scattered might be comforted. That, that was in, in James' heart. He, do, you, do you think uh, he, he wrestled with going outside of the Jewish nation? I mean, he, in this letter he, he wrote to, to the 12 tribes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost you can almost see he had a he may have struggled um, with reaching outside his race. And did it take this was an effort for him to kind of draw himself back into the yeah. to the Jewish yeah. way of thinking. Just, or? just a question. Yeah, uh, I believe he had. As we mentioned, he had a heart for his people. Yeah. He was concerned about those that had been scattered and possibly not having received the gospel yet, yeah. not hearing about Christ and, and his redemptive power. And so he, I think he's writing this in this way in hopes that this letter will get to them. And they will be able to hear about a, a faith life that he is living. And that the church is practicing and teaching that they will come to, to the same realization that Jesus came and died for them just as much as he did for anybody else. And so uh, in this writing, he, he is wanting to reach his brothers. His, his uh, flesh brothers, his national brothers. And, uh, but I think also it's for us too. Oh, yeah. And uh, so uh, that's why James is so different from any of the other epistles. It's just, it's just so much more vast than what some of the other writings are. Let's go on here in verse 2. We're going to read down through verse 12, and then we'll comment on uh, some of that. And, and if you have comments, please let me know if you have something to say. Uh, there's, a, there's going to be a lot in this that, that we're going to try to uncover. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trial... any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat 
but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the passion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. That may seem like it's a, a difficult thing to uh, ask someone who's going through uh, a trial or temptation to take joy in that. It might seem like that's just an impossible thing. But James realizes that such trials brings patience. We should never ask God not to test us or never... Uh, let us go through anything difficult in our lives. There's a, a, a song that said, Thank you for the valley I walked through today. And uh, so just because we come up against the mountain doesn't mean that we can't overcome that mountain. Or James knows that out of the trials comes patience. And patience has a purpose. We need to understand that. Patience has a purpose. It helps us reach a state of completeness. And when we reach that state of completeness, we have need of nothing else. That's what uh, David wrote in the 23rd Psalm uh, about uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want as long as the Lord is our shepherd, we have need of nothing else. So that's that purpose of patience, is to bring us to that state of completeness. That we realize that that's all we need. The Lord is on our side. That's all we need. And if we lack wisdom, we ask of God. Ask God to give you wisdom. God is gracious in giving wisdom. But we must ask him in faith. And it has to be an unwavering faith. As James described it. We can't waver. In our faith. We can't uh, have any doubt. About God's willingness. And his uh, desire to give us. What we ask for. If, if we do. We're most likely not going to get it. Those who waver in their faith should not expect God to give them anything. Now that may sound harsh. But God wants us to trust him. As James talks about this, he, he kind of indicates that someone who rises and falls like the waves of the sea is not likely to value the blessings that God will give him. If you're up one day and down the next, God's probably not going to give you a whole lot. But God does bless that individual with wisdom who is unwavering in his faith. And why should God bless anyone with wisdom when he knows that the one that is asking for it is unsteady in his faith. You wouldn't ask somebody who can't walk straight to carry your eggs for you, would you? You don't want your eggs to get broken. And so God doesn't want people that are unsteady handling his business. And his blessings. But you see, we have one God to trust in. And one God to be led by. And that knowledge should keep us steady. That should be enough to keep us steady in our faith and in our walk. Verse 9, he said, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Social standing 
should not destroy the relationship between children of God. If somebody walks into this church and they may not be dressed like we're accustomed to. The first thing out of our or in our minds should not be they're unworthy. Jesus talked about something similar to that. When he said, if someone comes into your midst that is dressed like a, a king, you set him up front. Someone comes in that's not dressed that well, you put him in the back. It's not the way you do it in the, in the house of God. Amen. Everyone should be treated the same in the eyes of the Christian. And so that should not be something that would destroy our relationship, our social standing. Christians can be rich. I've known of, of Christian people that are rich. They have a lot of, of uh, wealth according to the world standards. But they've never allowed that, that standing or that wealth to cause them to look down on anyone else. You may know this, you may not know this, but the man that owned and started the Hobby Lobby was a Christian. In fact, he's a member of this organization. Or he was. I, I haven't heard about him in a number of years, but, but he was. And, and he helped build uh, some of our churches out in Oklahoma where they originated. And so being rich doesn't disqualify you from being a Christian. When Jesus said, it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through an eye of a needle, he wasn't saying that it's impossible for the rich to enter the kingdom. It all depends on how the rich look at their wealth. Abraham was a rich man. He was probably about the richest man of his day. But he believed in God. And he followed the leading of God. When God spoke to him and said, I want you to leave from where you are and go to a place. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you when you get there. How many of us we start out on a trip not knowing where we're going. Not knowing when we actually arrive at where we need to be. <laughs> Steve done it many times. <laughs> but Abraham did. And not just him, but he took his entire family with him. All the cattle, their oxen, their camels, their... Uh, the chickens, the pigs, I guess if they had pigs, I don't know if they had pigs or not. But everything that he owned, they took with them. And when they got to where God wanted them to be, God said, this is it. You've arrived. So the rich can hear the voice of God. And both the rich and the poor are permitted to rejoice. And James says, let the lowly rejoice. But he also says, let the rich rejoice. In verse 11, he says, for the sun has no sooner risen with the burning heat than it withereth the grass. On a hot day, it don't take long <coughs> for chocolate to melt, does it? <laughs> it don't take long to, to get tired when you're working out in the hot sun. And so what James is saying here is that riches are uncertain. We can't rely on our riches.
In our culture today, we can have a fortune today and tomorrow it'd be all gone. All it takes is for the government to pass some new law and it can wipe out a lot of people. So we, need, we shouldn't trust in our riches. They're, they're too uncertain. And he says, just as the flower fades in the heat of the sun, a rich man will fade away if he trusts in his riches. So we can't trust in our wealth. If his ways that James is talking about in there, when he speaks of his ways, if his ways are the things of this world, he's going to fade. Just like the grass. So the rich man should rejoice in the grace of God that makes him humble. Verse 12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptations. It's a blessing to go through temptation. God looks upon you with blessing when he allows temptation to come your way. Let's continue to read verse 13 through 18. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. We should never put the blame on God for the temptations that we go through. Now, there is a difference in temptation and trial. Sometimes God will put us through to a test. But in every case, he knows the outcome. And he will not allow us to be tempted above that which we are able. But the scripture tells us that before we ever enter into the temptation, he's always provided. He's already provided the way out that we may be able to bear it. But don't say when you're tempted, well, God's just tempting me. God will not tempt you to do evil. God doesn't want his children to do evil, so he's not going to tempt you to do evil. So what causes us to do evil things sometimes? James explains that. We're drawn away of our own lust and enticed. Do you realize that there are only three ways the devil can defeat you? And he uses the same three over and over again. It's through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every sin stems from one of three. Those three things are all three. Every sin. When we are drawn away of our own lust, either the lust of the flesh, which is sinful desires, the lust of the eyes, seeing something that we want that's not ours to have, or the pride of life, wanting to be something that God never intended us to be. And so James says that when we are, if we're tempted, it's because we've allowed ourselves to be drawn away by our own lust and enticed. You see, when you allow yourself to be drawn away, that's what brings on the enticement. And what happens then? 
when he has drawn away of his own lust and enticed them, when lust hath conceived. Now, what does that what does that mean? When lust has conceived, it has found a place in you. You have made a place in your heart for that lust. And when it is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he gives a warning. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Don't allow yourself to fall into those temptations. Keep yourself pure. And know that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Anything good ever happens in your life, it comes from God. The devil will never give you anything that's good for you. If you get rich by stealing from other people, that's not a good way to get rich. It'll destroy you. If you get what you desire by taking it from someone else, that's the devil giving that to you. It's not good. So let's continue. Verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren. Now, notice this is not the first time he has used this phrase, my beloved brethren. He's already used it several times in, in these scriptures. He loves his brothers, his family, his people. He loves those of the faith. And his desire is that they not fall out of the grace of God. Therefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. We ought to be real quick to hear. But we shouldn't react to what we hear too quickly. We shouldn't open our mouths too fast to say things in response. That's one of the things some of you know or remember Brother uh, Billy Murray he used to be general overseer of the church. He followed M.A. Tomlinson when Brother Tomlinson retired. Brother Murray was a precious man. And there were several times when I got to sit under him, listen to him. Uh, and he was here in Kentucky one time after he had become general overseer. And we had uh, a pastor's uh, conference at the campground. And, and we had the opportunity to sit with him and ask questions. And every time someone would ask Bishop Murray a question, he didn't just rattle off something. But he would lower his head. And for a few moments, he would contemplate the response that he felt was appropriate. And I've heard a lot of people just as soon as you ask a question, they've got an answer for you. <laughs> it may not be the answer you need. And so that's what James is talking about here. We need to be quick to hear what people have to say or what questions they have, but be slow to answer. Don't just blurt out the first thing that comes to your mind because the devil can put things in your mind too. And it may not be what that person needs to hear. <coughs> And so be swift to hear, but slow to speak. And especially be slow to react in wrath. Don't respond with criticism or out of anger. 
but let God's love direct you in what you do. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You can't do it both ways. You can't show the righteousness of God and at the same time react in the wrath of man. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Put away from you those things that are worldly, those things that are not like God, those things that aren't pleasing to Him. Put those away from you. Don't let them be a part of your uh, conversation or of your lifestyle. But let the Word of God be engrafted in you. The Scripture says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against God. The more of the word that we have in our heart, the less likely we are to violate any of the word. When we come up against something, our first thought should not be how to react. Our first thought should be to search our heart and see what the word that is grafted in our heart tells us. And we need to respond then as the word would direct us to respond. Hide the word in your heart. No man can take it out. And that engrafted word is able to save your soul. That engrafted word will help you to not make a mistake in your reaction to an individual or to an event. Or to a temptation. It will help you. To secure your salvation. But be ye doers of the word. Not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. James wanted us to be doers. Of the word. We got a lot of hearers. But there's not many doers. And so James is telling us, put into action the faith that you claim you have. Be a doer of the word. And not just a hearer. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his face, his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. I keep wondering every day when I look in the mirror, who is that? I don't recognize that guy. The Spirit family used to sing a song, Time has made a change in me. Well, time makes a change in us. And so as we look at ourselves, we need to remember what we look like. And I think what James is trying to get across to us here is when, when we look at ourselves in the mirror, the reflection we see should not just be our natural look, but it should be a look of Christ coming out of us. But if all we see is the natural man, then we're going to go away and we're going to forget what we even look like. So understand the word today. Verse 25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be righteous, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. There's only one person that can control what you say. And that's you. I 
And a word, once it's spoken, can never be recalled. So we need to be careful before we speak. And then Paul, or excuse me, James says, For pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. Now listen to what he considers to be pure religion. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. We need to understand that we don't have a choice as to where we are. We're here. We're in this world. But we do have a choice as to how we live our lives in this world. And so we need to guard ourselves and be unspotted from the world. And the scripture tells us that he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So if we expect to go with him, we can't be spotted when he comes. We must be clean and pure. Anybody have a comment that you'd like to share? Anything that you feel might be a help to us tonight. I just think that last section of scripture is so impactful for the Christian life and it's so quick it can be easy to speed past the weight that it carries. Mm -hmm. And you touched on it but the Apostle James is telling us in the 21st century that if our words do not match the word, the word of God, mm -hmm. and our actions do not match the word of God, then we can claim to be religious, we can claim to be sanctified, we can claim to be saved, but our religion is worthless when the walk doesn't match the talk. Right. And I think sometimes in Christianity, we can fall into the trap of classifying sins and grievances against the Lord. But Scripture tells us that all sin is sin and God is not a respecter of persons. And so we have to be vigilant that we are daily dying to our flesh and allowing the Holy Spirit to produce in us that righteousness that affects every part of who we are and especially our speech. Because if our speech does not match the word of God, James makes it very clear. Our religion is utterly right. worthless. Right. Right. Sure. There's a life point in my book. It says our words are verbal expressions of our souls. Until our mouths are brought under control and submitted to the Lord, he cannot redeem and restore our souls, our minds, wills, and emotions. Right. Every word we speak has consequences. Good or bad. Good or bad. Yes. Lord bless you tonight. Those that are watching on Facebook, we thank you for joining us tonight. Hope that you have received something from this lesson. We'll continue next week uh, in the book of James. And... Uh, Encourage you to come and be with us Sunday morning here at Church Alive uh, on Blue Lake Road. We same place we've been for a long time.